Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Sean Aaron, uh, and I'm from uh, Wits University in South Africa, and I'm representing uh, HJA Bionet, which I'm a part of. And today I'm going to tell you a bit about our experience with developing a sustainable uh, approach to providing bioinformatics training on the African continent. So at the onset of this project, oh, wait, hang on, sorry, uh, there's a slide there. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, HJA Bionet is a pan-African bioinformatics network that was initiated in order to uh, support uh, the projects of the HC Africa Consortium. Uh, and uh, the HC Africa Consortium uh, basically consists of a number of projects uh, aimed at uh, understanding the genetic and environmental contribution to common complex disorders. Uh, uh, consists of about 27, oh, well, it consists of 27 research institutes in 17 African countries. Uh, and a major focus of the network is to actually develop a sustainable approach to providing bioinformatics training uh, uh, on the continent. So at the start of the project, uh, we were obviously aware, and this has come up a lot in the session, uh, that we would need to train individuals from a, a variety of different backgrounds. And this included uh, biologists, geneticists, clinicians, mathematicians, and system administrators. So to get, together with that, we also realized that not all these individuals would require the same level of bioinformatics training. So we would need to train bioinformatics users, uh, we would need to train bioinformatics scientists, and we would also need to train bioinformatics engineers. So keeping this in mind, uh, we actually decided to, to explore multiple modes for providing training uh, within the network, and these are the four modes uh, that we actually ended up using, and I'm just going to unpack each of one of them in a bit more detail, and then tell you a bit more about the impact of each of these different types of training modes. So we started off firstly with running face-to-face -face workshops, and this was actually, the reason behind this was uh, when we started off the project, there was a limited number of people with bioinformatics skills to provide training uh, on the continent, uh, and this seems to be a worldwide phenomenon, it seems, uh, where there is a lack of uh, trained people on the, uh, in bioinformatics. And so we started off running these face-to-face -face workshops. Uh, and uh, initially, what we had to do is sort of fly in uh, international trainers for the first few workshops. But then we also hosted two train-the-trainer workshops, where we then were able to train up uh, individuals within uh, the African continent uh, on particular skills, and what we found was later on when we started running these face-to-face -face workshops, we actually had local people uh, or local individuals running these courses. Uh, and the topics for these face-to-face -face workshops range from initially basic bioinformatics uh, and then later on to more specialized uh, specific topics on running particular data analysis. Uh, and then initially when we, we started up the network, this was actually a good way to get people together uh, get people together in one room and actually build up the network. So it was a good opportunity when we started off to, to get people to know each other and form uh, relationships and collaborations. So to complement the face-to-face -face workshops uh, or trainings as well, at the same time we also initiated an internship program. Uh, and this is where we felt that you know, getting people together in a room for a week uh, and running a particular course you don't really have enough time to, to get to grips with actually running that analysis. You're not really confident enough to go back and run that in, at your institute. So what we decided to do was set up this internship program, and this allowed individuals to spend up to three months at one of a, uh, at a particular partner institute uh, and learn a particular set of skills or a particular skill. Um, and we actually, up to today, I think it's about 14 or 15. There might have been one more uh, added on to, uh, up until now. Uh, we had uh, knowledge transferred between 16 institutes, and this is a list of these particular specific skills that these individuals uh, have learned during their internship. Um, and then another thing that we also did was we encouraged the, the interns, once they returned to their home institutes, to actually try and find a way to share that knowledge uh, with the people back at their home institutes. So the, the workshops work well, and the internships work well, but while we were running these workshops and internships, we realized that there were quite a few challenges that we came across. Um, the first was that with a workshop, obviously, you're limited in the number of people that you can actually address. That's limited by the number of people you can have in your classroom, and also when you're running a practical workshop, 
you know, it's practical to have 25 people in a workshop because you have to be quite hands-on. So that was one of the limitations that we had. Uh, a big limitation is travel-associated costs. So it costs a lot of money to fly all the participants out to a place, put them up on housing and feed them for a week. Uh, so that was, a, that was a big challenge for us. Uh, in some instances where we were hosting workshops in particular parts of the continent, we had issues with internet instability. Again, the, the issue of access to specialized bioinformatics expertise was also a problem. Uh, and then we also had very un in Africa and I guess across the world now, we have unpredictable socio-political events. Uh, and that has been a hindrance, that was a hindrance in running some of our courses. And then we had some petty issues with visas, applying for visas, people getting visas. Uh, and also disease outbreaks in countries when we're running courses. So these were all sort of the challenge that we came across with running these face-to-face these -face workshops. And so at that point, we realized, okay, well, we need to think of, a, a, of an alternative way to provide training uh, that maybe is a little bit more efficient than face-to-face -face workshops or would complement face-to-face workshops as well. Uh, and so we developed actually a, an online platform or course design for presenting uh, a distance-based learning course. Uh, I think some of you might have come across this before. Anyone heard of the IBT course? Uh, a couple of people in the audience, yeah. So we developed this introduction to bioinformatics uh, online course. Uh, and essentially that we had a model whereby we were able to provide live online training. Uh, and we decided to trial this training with the, with the basic online, uh, a basic introduction to bioinformatics course. Uh, and it, it was a essentially uh, addressing our bioinformatics users who actually just wanted to learn about bioinformatics tools and how to use them. And basically the course ran over three months uh, and we had two days a week of contact time, which was three hours per session. And we had a distance-based learning model whereby we had actual physical classrooms set up across the continent at different sites. And those classrooms then linked into a uh, via video conferencing system to the trainer who was live online and we had recorded lectures as well as live Q&A sessions. Uh, and we used MCON for the video conferencing system. And then we used a system called Vula, which is based on Sakai, to actually manage the course and run our assessments and assignments and our forums for discussion. So this was the course in 2017. Those are all just the sites uh, that we had in 2017. The blue is the, are the sites for 2016. The red triangles were the new sites. Uh, we're actually running the course again uh, this year uh, in September, and we've got about 30 classrooms already enrolled. Um, uh, in terms of sustainability, what we found was that uh, a lot of the participants from previous courses actually become the teaching assistants for the next year's course. So that, was, uh, that was quite good. Uh, and then in 2017, we had about 580 enrolled participants and around 130 volunteer staff. Uh, and I, this, was a, this was a good experience for us, especially developing the model for running the course. So we actually published a paper on this. Uh, and this was the paper that was published on the actual course design. Uh, and I've got a poster, uh, A68, uh, which I'll be at uh, this evening. So if anyone has any questions on, on the online course, come and have a chat with me. Uh, we actually used it for the introductory course, and we've also run a genomic medicine course for nurses using the same platform. So uh, once we sort of ran a lot, quite a few of these workshops, we had the internships going, we had the online course, we began to build up you know, uh, 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 basically a critical mass of expertise on the continent. We realized that we needed to shift from the traditional workshops to a more data-centered or outcomes-based uh, type of training. And so we started running hackathons or data jamborees. Uh, and so for those, those of you who don't know, I'm sure more, all of you do, but a jamboree or a hackathon, essentially you bring together a group of experts across a number of different fields. You give them a problem or a challenge and you say, have a couple of days, think amongst yourselves and go and solve the problem or come out uh, with a data analysis for a particular data set. Um, so we ran two, uh, we've run two hackathons so far. The first was a cloud computing hackathon, a cloud computing and pipeline development hackathon. Uh, and the second was a data-centered uh, hackathon uh, where we partnered with the Dream Challenges, uh, IBM Research Africa, and the University of Notre Dame to actually uh, analyze a particular, particular data set. So this was uh, also a learning experience for us. So we felt that we would share our experience with the rest of the world. 
So we actually published two papers. So the first one is actually just a paper describing how we went about organizing this hackathon, or these hackathons. And the second paper there is actually the hackathon that was run in collaboration with the Dream Challenges and IBM Research Africa. Uh, and my colleague Pelilani, who's sitting over there, uh, has, a post, has a poster A369, and that's actually uh, a poster describing those pipelines that were developed during the Cloud Hackathon. So I'll go have a look at them, and I think it'll still be up. He was there yesterday, but it'll still be up. So although we like to think that we've got everything right and we know what we're doing, we also run training impact surveys. So at the end of each of our, survey, uh, each of our courses, we run an exit survey. Uh, but then we also want to know what is the long-term impact of our training. So in order to sort of measure that, what we do is every six months, uh, we have an, uh, a survey sent out to anyone that's attended any of our training before. Uh, and that goes out every six months. It's an automated uh, survey through RedCap. Uh, and this is uh, what I'm going to show you now is some of the results from the, the last uh, round of that survey, uh, of which we had a 23% uh, response rate, which is reasonably okay. Uh, the map I'm showing you on the right-hand side is uh, basically showing you the, the location of the respondents, um, and the lighter colors are, obviously, the, the lighter colors are the lower ones, and the brighter colors are where we've got more responses from. Uh, you might be interested that there's some respondents outside of Africa. So the question asked here is actually, what is your current location when you're completing the surveys? So we actually do have a lot of participants moving around, doing internships on exchange programs. Uh, so that's why we have people uh, across the world and not just in Africa. So this goes back to what I spoke about in one of my first slides was the challenge of teaching people or training people in bioinformatics from a variety of different backgrounds. So not everyone can see, but it's essentially uh, going down the left-hand side is your particular role. So the, for example, the first bar is uh, senior faculty member, lecturer, professor, postdoctoral fellow, PhD students, etc., and the colors indicate what is your educational background. So the light green, sort of on the left-hand side, is molecular biology. The purple is microbiology. Uh, the orange is biochemistry. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you can see it's a it's a mix. It's a variety of people from a variety of different backgrounds that we actually do provide training for. Um, in terms of impact. Uh, we, we asked in, in our surveys, we ask uh, a few questions in, to try and determine what the impact of our training is. Um, so the first graph that I'm showing on the top there, we ask the question, has attending any of our in a bio, uh, HA Binet training led to the submission of a, of a thesis or a dissertation? Uh, and what we see, let's see if this pointer works. I'll just use the cursor. So what we see uh, is here is that for hackathons, internships, and live online learning, we see that there has been, well, a significant proportion of our respondents have said that it has led to some sort of, uh, it has helped in the submission of an MSc or thesis, uh, thesis or dissertation. Uh, whereas we see it's quite low for the train the trainer, which we expect there were only two train the trainer workshops. Uh, and workshops is also relatively low. Uh, for the second question was, has attending any of the training led to uh, submission of a publication? Uh, and again, for hackathons and internships, it's quite high. For live online learning, it's uh, lower. Uh, train the trainer, we had some outputs from that, and for workshops, it's a bit lower. The next question was, has the training led to any sort of collaborations? So we see for hackathons and internships, reasonably high. For live online learning, dips a bit. Uh, train the trainer and workshops as well, it's a bit lower. And then the last question was, uh, has, um, has uh, attending, uh, or, or how much of the training that you have attended, have you shared it with anyone else? Uh, and you'll see that for live online training, this seems to be quite high. And for the workshops, it seems to be quite high. So just to summarize what we sort of learned from, from, from those few graphs that I showed, is that for online training, uh, some of the pros are uh, it's cost efficient. You're able to reach a relatively large audience. Uh, the material is easy to share because of 
initially while you're going through the course, the material is either recorded and put up, and it's put up in a nice place, and it's well organized. Uh, the cons are, uh, it's a challenge to foster a sense of community when you're running an online course. I think that's always a challenge with an online course, and there are ways to overcome that. Uh, and it's a bit of a challenge to form collaborations again. Uh, with the live workshops and internships, the pros are that you actually spend a dedicated amount of time in a room trying to learn a particular skill, and you have close interactions with your trainers and your TAs if you have any questions or queries. Uh, some of the cons, again, I mentioned quite a few before, costly, unpredictable logistics, and you, you reach a, l a limited number of people are reached uh, with the live workshops. Uh, with the hackathons, the pros are uh, you have a defined aims and output. So in, the, in that case, you, you know, you have a defined output, and in most cases, uh, that can lead to some sort of publication. Uh, you develop practical skills because the participants get a lot of hands-on experience. And you're able to foster you know, this cross-disciplinary uh, interaction between participants. Some of the cons is your selection of your participants is crucial for a hackathon to be successful. You have to have a good combination of skills. Uh, there is some sort of base knowledge requirement, so it's, in some cases it's not always open to everyone. And you do, I mean, es essentially have a limitation in terms of the audience that you can reach, uh, which is the same as running live face-to-face uh, -face workshops. So just to sort of wrap up, and, and uh, in summary, what we learned from comparing the results from the different training modes, and this is sort of alluded to earlier, is that there isn't really an optimal training mode. Uh, different people from different backgrounds actually prefer different types of training. And so that's what I'm showing on the right-hand side. Again, uh, on, the, on, on the bottom axis are people from different backgrounds, so data analyst, developer, IT support to MSc, PhD lecturer on the right-hand side. And it's basically, we ask the question, what is your preferred mode of training? And in purple on the top is internships, and at blue at the bottom are your face-to-face -face workshops. So what we can see is that you know, the, the, the live sort of face-to-face, hands-on, still seems to be the popular approach to learning or to learning new skills. Uh, but also on the other hand, the sort of live training events are still new. Uh, people are still sort of getting to grips with how useful they can be. And from what we've seen with the IBT course and the genomic medicine course, uh, that it can be a very useful mode for providing training to a very large audience if you get it right. Uh, but again, it's something that needs, you know, you, you have to improve on live uh, online training and obviously learn each year as you actually present it. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the HA Binet uh, group and in particular the education and training working group. So all the work that I presented is actually uh, done by the Education and Training Working Group. Uh, Catherine Johnston, who uh, actually generated the figures for the, from the survey results, as well as Sumar, uh, Sumir Panji, uh, and then the funders for, for allowing us to do this great work. Thank you. Hey, nice talk. Um, so from the, the different categories of, of uh, students, you mentioned the assist and min versus the yeah, user. Yeah. What's the ratio of actual numbers? Do, you, do people self-identify with one of those three? Do you, do you have an idea of what the, is it like 10 to 1? Of, like in mid, for example, I would, I would assume it would be a smaller group. In terms of, 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 of whether they're training to be data science, data users? Yeah. So that's not really a question that we ask directly. Okay. Um, but what's your sense from? Uh, have... it's, I think it's, I, I think we have a mixture. I think I think yeah. I think I think my opinion would be smaller number of individuals want to become actual developers. Engineer. Developers. A lot of them are want to be users. Yeah. Uh, and then the rest are in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the challenge, but yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's maybe something important that we should add to our survey, yeah. the long-term survey. Or, or maybe see if people self-identify with one of those three yeah. after defining them. Yeah, cool. Great, That's Thanks. a good point. So, so, so it's something that we've, we've tried to, to improve with our online course, in the IBT course. 
Um, and one of the ideas that we have is to actually, uh, within the training, to introduce projects that will allow uh, uh, classrooms, across classroom collaborations. So, so, so we haven't tried it yet, and it's something that we'll use in the future, but just to, to improve that interaction between the different classrooms, because they do uh, work in isolation. I mean, and, and there's other things that we do. So, so when we run the, the IBT course, we have sessions where the, each classroom is able to write up their bio and they get to activate their webcams and speak to the rest of the classrooms. So we do have ways in which we try to foster that, that sense of community as well. Our next speaker is uh, Shannon McQueenie from Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland. Um, and she's